Well, thank you again for your kind attention. Uh, when Frank set this up with me, he gave me an hour and 15 minutes for my lessons. I don't usually talk an hour and 15 minutes in a lesson. So if I'm plathering on and on and you need a break, somebody just wave and say, hey, you're killing me here. The mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. And so I'm trying to be honest with my assignment and not cheat you guys out of any time. Uh, but I also understand that it's, it could be a, a long day. This next section is, is what I like to call a, a fair proofing your marriage and then discuss a little bit the concept of an inverse and intimacy. It's very, very difficult to have this discussion and folks not hear one thing when I've said another. Remember the difference between correlation and causation. Just because something is here and I can associate it with something else doesn't mean there's a causal relationship. But if you can find those things, sometimes you can predict those things. Every addiction that I've ever dealt with has a root in trauma. Period. Okay? Because when the human brain is traumatized, it generalizes things. My brain is designed to protect me from getting hurt again. Okay? So when my brain is scanning the environment, it takes things that are similar and treats them the same. So if I get stung by a hornet, I'll dodge a housefly. If I got bit by a Doberman, I'll get nervous around a Jack Russell. If I'm scared of snakes and I'm raking the yard and there's a garden hose, I'll jump. Because my brain says, hello, <laughs> been on this ride before, don't like it. In the same way that our brain generalizes that stuff, our brain connects stuff. That may or may not need to be connected. For instance, when I say ice cream, all your brains made a neural cluster. Some of you pictured an ice cream parlor. Some of you pictured an ice cream cone. Some of you pictured an ice cream sandwich. Some of you pictured a blizzard. Some of you pictured that thing that McDonald's is supposed to sell but never can because their machine's broken. <laughs> Has anyone ever actually had one of those? <laughs> Our machine's broken, you know. Some of you saw an ice cream freezer. Some of you are sitting at a park on 4th of July. Some of you are on grandmother's front porch. Your brain takes things and connects them. When things get connected with trauma, that's a powerful connection. When I feel this way, and I did this to help attack that feeling, or doing this got associated with that, that's a super powerful bond. That bond is stronger than behaviorism. That bond is stronger than when my behavior costs me more than it costs you, I'll change my behavior. You can't put a guy in prison long enough, you can't beat him hard enough, he can't beat enough car wrecks, you can't take enough stuff away from him to make him quit using his stuff. Because his addiction is linked to a feeling that he may or may not be consciously aware of. When I feel insecure, trapped, powerless, or helpless, I smoke, drink, shoot, gamble, look at porn, shop, whatever. So correlation, not everybody who has trauma is an addict. But all addicts have some kind of trauma they are either aware of or not aware of. Does, does that make sense? You familiar with Pavlov and the dogs? Uh, ring a bell, make the dogs salivate as you feed them. And then you can ring the bell and the dogs will salivate when there's no food. We have those connections that take place in our lives. So as we talk about some, some dynamics that occur with affairs, it's going to be easy for somebody to go, Oh! My spouse had an affair, and it's because I didn't do this. Well, no, if I could cause you to do it, I could cause you not to do it. So there are some things that set us up and make us vulnerable for affairs, but they're not causative. Everybody clear on that? So please you know, don't, don't hear that. Um, that's one of the hardest things to talk to, to a spouse is when another spouse is looking at pornography. You know, she says, oh, my, I'm not pretty, I'm not skinny, I'm not whatever. And he looks at porn. He was looking at porn before he married you. It had nothing to do with you. <laughs> okay. Let's chase that a little bit. You know, and moms are, are good at this. You know, they, they catch their teenage sons and they find something on their iPad or their iPhone. They bring them to my office. 
My son's looking at naked females on the internet. Your son's looking at naked people on the internet. Yes, looking at females. Yes, praise God. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> it is 2021, all right? Now, I sit down with that boy and say, are you interested in naked girls? He goes, absolutely. And it's easier and probably more pleasurable to look at professional naked girls than those girls you go to high school with. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I, Jackie and I watched the thing about, was it Sleeping Beauty? The, the dwarves? Is that Sleeping Beauty? I'm not a Disney guy. Snow White, there you go. Snow White, yeah, that's it. Well, they had some skinny teenage girl and the evil wicked queen was Char Char Charlize Theron. I went, <laughs> you know, I don't know what Charlize Theron is insecure about. You know, mirror, mirror on the wall, forget the teenage girl, okay? Well, these teenage boys get interested in naked females and they go, yeah. Well, it's, it's sinful and it's lustful, but it's normal. And at some level, it's probably even healthy that a teenage boy grows up and is interested in naked girls. But if you start looking at naked girls, and looking at naked girls gets associated with, I do this when I'm bored, when I'm stressed, when I'm hungry, when I'm angry, when I'm lonely, when I'm tired, then pornography gets linked as a mood elevator and it goes from I'm interested in sex to I use sex to change my moods. That's when it becomes an addiction. Now, this doesn't cause that, but if I see sex, it gets associated with mood change, that's when you have an addiction. Correlation, not causation. Is that too much too fast? Okay, so when you start talking about affairs, I can say if I see this, 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 and this, I can say I may have one of these in the woods. Or if I see one of these, that's not the problem. That's a symptom of another problem. So let's look at what Peter says. Peter's writing to the Christians. And he's helping them understand that they have been called to participate in God's divine nature. Escape the corruption of the world and participate in the divine nature of God. So by the time we get to, to chapter 2, he's talking in chapter 2, verse 4, he talks about us being living stones, that we're a living temple. In every culture, in every religion, everywhere, a temple was an intersection between the divine and the human. Every single time. If you've got a religious temple, and I don't care if it's to Shiva Lingua or if it's to the Judeo-Christian God, if you've got a temple, it's an intersection between the divine and the human. Uh, in Greece, they had a, a temple for Zeus. They had an iron chariot that they had magnets positioned so that they could make the chariot float. So this poor superstitious pagan goes in to see Zeus and this thing floats with no wires. <gasps> The divine and the human have had an interaction. God's temple that Solomon built, God said, my heart and my eyes will be here forever. And that's where Israel will come and have an intersection with the divine and the human. By the time we get to the New Testament, we become God's temple. God lives in us and we live in Him. We are a, a, an intersection between the divine and the human. Uh, during the pandemic when churches were not meeting together. And they talk about, we can't have church. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. What you do in this building is worship. What you do out there is church. <laughs> hey, where's your church? Well, he's at the high school. He's over here at the farm. He's running a charter boat. My church is all over the place. God says, I live in you and you live in me. So when we get to First Peter, he's talking to his people about being church. Okay? Verse uh, 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from the fleshly lust that war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, by your good works which they observe, they will be put to shame and glorify God on the day of visitation. He says, listen, as a participant in the divine nature, as a person who lives in God and God lives in you, as a living stone, as a temporary resident, as a passer through on this plane of existence, you, you got to live in such a way that if people accuse you of bad stuff, 
They look like idiots when they do it. You put them to shame. Now, how does a spiritual creature behave in a physical world? Well, the first thing you do is, is, is you're submissive to your government. You don't cause trouble. You get along with the civil government. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. It doesn't matter. That's what weather means. It doesn't matter to the king supreme or to governors or to those who by him for you are sent for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Now, it is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You're free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak of service, but as bond service of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Peter says, look, as a person who is in God, as a person who has God in you, a living temple, a living stone, you live in such a way, you, this is not your home. You're just, you're just passing through. Uh, maybe inappropriate. I have a podcast. Keeping up with Jones, the Lonnie Jones podcast adventure. It's based in anecdotal wisdom. I talk about getting tased with the police. One of those things you do and when you're dumb. Uh, but it lasts five seconds. 50,000 volts for five seconds. I was, I was at the academy and they were tasing these young cadets and it sounded like the banshees were breeding <laughs> the noises we were hearing out there and T.A. Boyer said hey Lonnie would you come over here and, and show these kids how an adult gets tased sure so you know you go and, and you get zapped and as they lay you down they whisper a color in your ear and you're supposed to be able to repeat the color now how can you do that well it's five seconds I, I can do anything for five seconds Peter says you're living on this planet you're a sojourner it's brief you can hold your composure even when you're being electrified, okay? Now, how do you do that? You live in such a way that these people, if they accuse you of bad stuff, they're put to silence. Now, now what's the best way to do that? You don't cause trouble. Submit to your governor. Submit to your king. Submit to the authority. Submit to the laws. It's not your job to get out here and, and cause some kind of rebellion so that if, if they look at, look at these Christians, yeah? You know what those Christians did? Yeah, they made our neighborhood better. What those Christians did? Yeah, they had a good influence in our school. You know what those Christians... I mean, you look at the book of Acts, and you consider the book of Acts is addressed to a gentleman named Theophilus, and it tells the history of the church and, and a lot of Paul. I think it's the document that went with Paul to Rome to appear before the Caesar. That if you've got a city and it gets in an uproar because of Christianity, because the Jews don't like Christianity, not because the Christians started it. I think it's Paul's legal defense organized by, by the Holy Spirit through Luke. So you can say, hey, Paul's not ready to be, to be murdered yet by you guys. And Paul gets to live in a rented house for two years. People come and go, and Christianity gets a good reputation. Not until you get to Nero do you get a problem. So, so the, the early Christians were demonstrating that the best way to show that we're good, godly people is we don't cause trouble with the, the civil government. Keep reading. And servants... Be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable because of conscience toward God if one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. What credit is it when you are beaten for your faults and you take it patiently? And when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. This is what you recall to because Christ also suffered giving an example that you follow his footsteps. He committed no sin. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Who, When he was reviled, did not revile. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sin, might live righteous by his stripes. You were healed for you were like sheep going astray but you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Peter said, look, you've got you to gotta understand, you, you're, you're here temporarily as a pilgrim and a sojourner. You've got to keep yourself away from these lusts that war against your soul. And you want to live in such a way that if they accuse you of being an evildoer, it just makes them look foolish. What's the best way to do that? You, you just submit. If you're a, a, a person in a society, you submit to the governor, you submit to the king, you submit to the magistrates. 
And even if you found yourself in an untenable, unchristian situation where you were a slave, how do you respond to your master? You submit. He doesn't say slavery's right, doesn't say slavery's good. He said, didn't cause it, can't cure it, how do you cope with it? That's how you deal with a bad situation. He says, and even if you're in a place and a guy is harsh to you and you get punished unjustly, well, look at Jesus. Did he deserve the way he was treated? So this mindset of, as a Christian, you learn to endure difficult circumstances so that your circumstances don't determine your behavior. Your behavior is what it is regardless of circumstances. Read Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, the first part of it talks about these superhero endings. Samson and Jephthah and Dave and Barak and the prophets who put to flight armies of aliens, who quenched the violence of fire, who survived the violence of the sword. Women had their dead raised to life. The next verse says, Others were mocked and stoned and sown in asunder and received trials of cruel mockings. He says, Your faith does not affect your circumstances. Just because you have faith doesn't mean life will be easy. But don't let your circumstances affect your faith. So Peter tells his audience, this is how you live and don't get the reputation that Christians are troublemakers. You just submit. And then after he says that, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Now what does the word likewise mean? I'm sorry? In the same way. Yeah. Look, if you look at a Christian supposed to deal with the government this way and a slave supposed to deal with the master this way and look at how Jesus suffered on the cross, hey, when you get to the in, involve yourself with your spouse, wives, you've got a way to respond to your husband that is in, inconvenient and uncomfortable. But in the same way, wives, you be submissive to your husbands. And even if you're married to a guy who doesn't obey the word, he may by your conduct, by the way you live, be one without a word when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. He says, and, and, and God's commands are never arbitrary. Everything God's ever asked us to do is good for us. Everything God's ever asked us not to do is bad for us. Right? You, you got anything that comes with an owner's manual? Anybody own a two-stroke engine? A weed eater? A chainsaw? Anyone ever physically threaten a chainsaw? Why? Because if you're not a professional woodcutter, when do you use a chainsaw? Only when I need it. So it sat in the garage for nine years. And I didn't put stable in it. And I didn't change the oil. I didn't change the gas. And I didn't crank it every month. And now I've got to cut a limb. What happens? Right? Well, if you read that owner's manual, guess what it tells you to do? This is what you need to do to make your chainsaw run. Change the oil. Put some stable in it. I've got a little generator. I keep uh, airplane fuel in because airplane fuel won't gum up. Now my generator will run hot, <laughs> but it never gums up. I, I turned in my man card. I bought a battery-powered chainsaw. Okay, I just had to turn in my man card. <laughs> I need one with a battery because I can't make one run. Okay? You get things like this is how you make this thing run. Paul's not saying that men deserve to be submitted to. Paul's saying, if you want this thing to run, you lubricate it with submission. Men are lazy. We would rather let you be in charge. Now, we don't always act that way, but that's the way we act. I mean, when, when, when God made the first man, what was his job? He's a caretaker. And what does the caretaker do? He takes care of stuff. <laughs> But he lets his wife talk to a snake while being near a tree that God said, don't look at and don't touch. Sound like you're doing a good job here? When she sins, 
and God comes to the garden to talk to the sinner, who does he talk to? <laughs> hey, son, who's in charge here? And what does Adam do? Shoves her under the bus. <laughs> hey, Eve, check the transmission when that thing rolls over you. <laughs> All right? I mean, under the bus she went. And I think God said, since you abdicated your original position, I'm going to give you that position forever. Not because we deserve it, but because God ordained it. He tells the woman, and your desire will be for your husband. That's the exact same phrase in Hebrew when he tells Cain, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. He uses the image of a Babylonian threshold demon that's crouched out beside your door and if you step out of your threshold, this thing wants to conquer you. Eve, you're always going to want to be in charge of your husband. You're going to want to have dominion over him. Why? Because he set this pattern up. He's supposed to be the caretaker for taking care of stuff. And he lets you go to the middle of the garden, talk to a snake, eat fruit. And when I ask him about it, what did he do? <laughs> and by the way, it's not just the woman, but the woman you gave me. Not only did she do it, but it's your fault. God duck, here comes the bus. So guys are naturally prone to, if you give us any leeway, we'll abdicate our responsibility. And so Peter says, hey ladies, you want to get along with your husband? Make sure they know who's in charge. And that's not you. And that's not because you're inferior. That's just because that's the lubricant that makes men work. You ever, let, you ever left town and give your husband a list? Guys, how do you respond to the list? I'm a grown man. I just want to do that. Right? My wife knows if she can make me think it's my idea, I'll do it. <laughs> Every single time. You know, I watch her deal with Gunner. That's our grandson. And they'll be like, Grammy Jacks, they call me Jones. They call her Jacks. Grammy Jacks, I don't want a green popsicle. Well, you know, if we don't eat our green popsicles, we can't have our red popsicles. And, and she does this crocodile dundee jedi mind trick and he goes out in the yard and eating his green popsicle and i'm standing there on the porch amazed eating my green popsicle and i go wait a minute <laughs> this has been happening to me for years <laughs> i didn't know you know i mean peter says look as a christian you submit to government a slave submits to a master an employee submits to a boss christ submitted to the sufferings of the cross can't you guys submit to each other? And, and by the way, ladies, you will have more influence when you quit trying to have power. And you know the difference between power and influence? Power is what I can make you do. Influence is what I can cause you to do. Christianity is never about power. It's always about influence. And look at the influential people that served God. Look at the world changers. How many good kings in Israel? How many really powerful? David? Maybe Hezekiah? Maybe King Uzziah? How many people were in inferior positions that changed the world? Four kids who were prisoners of war, who became eunuchs? and absolutely ran the country of Babylon? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? A kid sold into slavery who had a good attitude and saved the world during a famine was little more than an elevated slave? King Xerxes is having a party to convince everybody in the world that we need to invade Greece. And while he gets drunk and says, you think my army's great? You should see how pretty my wife is. Vashti, come out here. Vashti says, I'm not coming out there in front of that drunk party. He deposes her and has the first episode of The Bachelor. <laughs> and a little girl, a little Jewish girl, who becomes part of the harem, has a date with the king. 
and becomes the queen. You think it's because Esther can do something sexually that these other women couldn't do? This is a little Jewish virgin girl. She didn't have any sexual prowess. If you're the king of, of Persia, you can have anything sexually you want. She didn't go in there and rock his world with her sex. She went in there with poise and demeanor and properness. That, that's what got Vashti kicked out anyway. She didn't submit. It was an inappropriate request the king made. But this is, for all practical purposes, a, a, a slave girl in the harem. And if you read the book of Esther, the trouble is because this guy won't kneel and, and I want to have a banquet. And she has three banquets that people come to. And at the end of the book, the guy who's the troublemaker is kneeling to her. He's actually laying on the couch on top of her is what he's doing. And the king snatches him out and has him killed. A little girl who gets captured as a prisoner of war. You ever had a teenage girl in your house try to get her to do housework? Okay. You get a teenage girl who is unnamed in the Bible who is captured by an, a Syrian captain named Naaman and she's the house slave. And her master has leprosy. And she says, if you knew the God of my country, you wouldn't have leprosy. My teenage daughter would say, you got leprosy? Good, hope your head rots off. I don't want to do housework anymore. <laughs> but she's a, she's a slave girl who says, just go see the prophet in Israel. And then he gets to the prophet in Israel, and because the prophet doesn't tell him to go slay a dragon, go dip in the river, he goes away. And, I, and who says, you know, if he asks you to go do something great, will you do it? Why not just dip and be clean? Who's that guy? slave look at the people who had zero power but had influence in the world wives live in such a way that you influence your husband's behavior without a single word and conduct yourselves in a way that is accompanied by respect or fear Verse 3, do not let your adornment merely be outward. And that doesn't say you can't do this, but don't rely on your beauty to come from arranging your hair, and wearing a gold, putting on fine apparel, but the inner person of incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, is very precious in the eyes of God. He says, you really want to know how to change the dynamic in your relationship? Look at, look at your relationship with federal government. Look at your relationship with your masters. Look at the relationship Jesus had with the unfair treatment of him. And don't just do the thing you're supposed to do in the circumstance you're doing it. And your beauty is not about the outward, it's about the inward. And if you can be submissive to a man, that's kind of the, the lubricant that men work on. Now, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. And sometimes you, you say things and they reveal more about your character than they should. I'm a fairly laid-back guy. I'm not high-maintenance. I'm not super sophisticated. And I like the fact that people treat me nice. I mean, people are absolutely kind to me. People are absolutely benevolent to me. I, I, I get treated in ways that make me tear up thinking about it. But I really don't care if you like me or not. But you're going to treat me with respect. You know how many men just nodded their head when I said that? About half the room went, yeah, I agree with that. You really don't have to like me, but you're going to treat me with respect. That's important to men. Now, we could, we could talk about some examples where that is replete in the Scripture. Men live on the fact that people treat us with a modicum of respect. And when a wife overmanages her man and tries to influence him with constant words. The Greek word for that is nagging. <laughs> okay, I was doing a seminar one time, and a lady said, I wouldn't have to tell him a bunch of times if he'd do what I said the first time. And she wasn't being funny. I just let that hand grenade lay there. <laughs> I just stepped away and said, wow. Okay, 
God's not saying that we deserve this treatment as much as God's saying, if you want to be smart about how to run your man, this, this keeps that two-stroke engine rolling. Now just think about the examples you can find. Go to the Old Testament just, just for a second, just to reinforce this. 2 Samuel chapter 6. David has done something and taken the clan of Saul and the people who are loyal to him and his group, and he's unified the kingdom. He's conquered the city of Jerusalem, which is a super cool story. And now it's his, it's his citadel. It's the, the center of his kingdom. It's not Hebron anymore. It's now Jerusalem. And the only thing he lacks, he didn't have the Ark of the Covenant there. The Ark of the Covenant stays in Shiloh in the tabernacle. And David has it moved. After it was captured by the Philistines, it ended up at the house of Obed-Edom. And the house of Obed-Edom begins to prosper. And David says, I want the ark to be in Jerusalem. I don't want it to be in Shiloh anymore. I'm going to build a special place for it. And I'm going to keep the ark here. And he moves the ark. Now, the first time he tries to move the ark, they move it inappropriately. They have it on the, the edge of an ox cart. It hits a bump. A guy named Uzzah reaches out to steady it. What happens to him? Done. Okay? A lot of mistakes going on before you get there. And by the way, Uzzah touching the ark and dying, and Nadab and Abihu offering strange fire and being burned up are the exceptions to the rule, not the rule. How many times do the people disobey God and aren't wiped off the face of the earth? Okay, Nadab and Abihu, Exodus chapter 34, get to see God. Most people don't know that story. He says, Moses, you come up here, you leave Aaron and the elders back. Moses approaches God and el the 70 elders, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu approach God and they see God and look like he's standing on a blue firmament and they have a ceremonial meal with God. After that, they offer the strange fire before God. Th those two things are, are the exception of God's interaction with people, not the rule. But anyway, so, so you, you've got the ark and David finally says, okay, the way to move the ark is to put it on handles and carry it into Jerusalem. And he comes into Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant. He's solidified the people, and now he's got God, or the representation of God's covenant, coming into the city of Jerusalem. Verse uh, 16, 2 Kings, or 2 Samuel, I'm sorry, chapter 6. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And so they brought the ark of the Lord, and they set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, and he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude, both men and women, everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, a cake of raisins, and all the people departed and everybody went to their house. And David returned to bless his own household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious! was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore I will play music before the Lord and I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maid servants of whom you have spoken... By them I will be held in honor. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children till the day of her death. You got David coming into the city. He's coming into the city and he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city that he's conquered and made his capital city. And he's dancing in front of the Ark. And he's leaping about. And his wife looks out the window and goes, Moron. And he has a, I mean, he has a celebration with the ark 
he gives everybody in the audience figs, raisins, and meat. Men and women. You talk about opulent. I mean, this is an unbelievable sign. The biggest day in David's political career. Blesses the people in the name of the Lord. Gives these lavish gifts, not just to the men, but to the men and the women. Unheard of. And he goes home, and there stands Michael on the porch with a double hipper and a foot tapper. <laughs> well, I hope you're proud of yourself. Now, was David immodest? He's wearing a linen ephod. I, I think what she's mad about is you had a parade today, and you're down there in your blue jean and your T-shirts, jumping around in front of them girls. David said, let me remind you that if you look at your last name and you look at my last name, your family didn't inherit the kingdom. I was appointed by God. And he had other people in your family he could have picked, line of succession. They happen to be dead right now. And if I want to play music, I'll play music. If I want to dance, I'll dance. And you think those handmaidens were impressed today? Wait till the weekend. And then Michael went to her grave childless. You know what that means, right? You don't order those things on Amazon. David didn't have sex with her ever again. You think there's an insecure... You think there's anybody in the Old Testament more secure in their masculinity than David? I mean, you talk about the, the man. Warrior, poet, king. How'd you like your business card to go, slain 10,000? <laughs> for sure, business card. He had his own theme song. And yet he goes home to this home and this woman treats him with contempt and disrespect and they're done in the bedroom. Now, if David, the warrior king of Israel, can be affected like that, you think my wife has the ability to crush my ego? I'm a five foot four bald middle-aged man. Right? Ladies, it's super important how you talk to your husband. And sometimes when I do entertain complaints in my office, one of the things the men say is I'm respected by everybody in this town except in my own house. Because women don't understand that the way you get a man to function properly is to treat him with respect. I don't want to, to read this next story. You remember the story of David and Nabal? David is camping out. This is uh, when he's running from Saul. And uh, this is before he becomes the king. Um, 1 Samuel 25. David and his men are living on the outskirts of a man's property. And they're basically performing the night watch for him. He got four to six hundred men that are basically a rebel bunch. By the way, these men who are discontent and unhappy and in debt become the mighty men. But he's with this guy, and it becomes sheep shearing time. And so David tells a couple of his young men, hey, put on your, your dress robes and go into the camp of this fella and say, hey, we understand you're having a big celebration. You're going to have a lot of guests in. You're going to be killing some sheep. Our guys would like some of the party favors. And these young men go in unarmed to this man named Nabal, and they go, hey, our master David has asked us to come in and, and ask if we can come to your banquet. And Nabal says, who's David? Who's the son of Jesse? You know, a lot of servants run away from their masters. You think that's not a contemptuous thing to say, a servant's run away from his master? I mean, he spits in these kids' faces and treats them with contempt. They go back and tell David, hey, we talked to this guy and he treated us contemptuously. David's response is, put on your swords. Now, in the old King James, he says, I want God to punish me if in the morning anybody's left alive who urinates against the wall. My grandson is four. He's learned he has outdoor plumbing. <laughs> and, and he will water the garden, son. Now, before he was older, we had to sit him on the toilet. But now he's learned I'm a little boy. I stand up to pee. David said, if it's old enough to pee against a wall, I'll kill it in the morning. There will not be a male left standing. In the oil field, the phrase is, everything old enough to die. 
man. He, I infer that he's mounted. He's coming, he's coming into town on Calvary. And a mounted guy against an armed, unmounted guy has a serious tactical advantage. A mounted guy coming in to a bunch of sheep herders will go through this place like a weed eater. And at the time, the undefeated warrior champion in Israel is David. And is there any force on earth that will prevent this slaughter? A lady named Abigail rides out and confronts an army of 400 men led by King David. And she bows to the ground and she offers him some food and says, Look, the job of hospitality is mine. I did not see the young men coming in. I would have treated them differently. You've got to forgive my husband. He's a dog. She has this statement. <laughs> she says, I wish the enemies of the king would be hurled away from him like a stone from the pocket of a sling. You think that's accidental language? <laughs> wow. There's no military force on the earth that stops David and 400 mounted men. And one lady with grace and poise and proper words stops this slaughter. She even says, I know you fight the Lord's battles. Did the Lord ask you to come kill this man? Or is it about your ego, son? This woman, with poise and grace, accomplishes more than any military force could do because not because she has power, but she has influence. Now, later on, she tells her husband, oh, by the way, David was headed to town, and the guy has a heart attack and dies. David scared a man to death. <laughs> okay? Just, just so. So when, the, when, when Peter writes and tells these women, listen, you treat your husband this way is because men run well with respect. And if you are not giving your husband proper respect at home and there's somebody in his workplace that does, what happens is you get an inverse in intimacy. And an inverse in intimacy is I end up spending time talking to this random female and she knows more about me and my wife than me and my wife know about her. And that happens at the office, that happens over the counter, that happens on Facebook, that happens on Snapchat, that happens on text messages. And when you get an inverse in intimacy, and once there's an inverse in intimacy, read Michelle Davis's book, Not Just Friends. Uh, Shirley, da Shirley Glass's book, I'm sorry, Not Just Friends. When you get an inverse in intimacy and then you add to it secrecy, deception, or lying, you have an affair. Now, for religious purposes, we have to talk about is it a consummated affair versus a non-consummated affair. But a pagan psychologist says when you have an inverse in intimacy and you start lying about it, you've already broken your marriage vows. Period. So if you want to create an environment where your spouse is unfaithful to you, all you've got to do is treat your spouse with contempt. Because a man will gravitate toward a place where he's admired and loved. A man will gravitate toward a place where he's admired and respected. She says, oh, you're so sensitive and you listen to me. And you go home and she says, well, you're an idiot. You forgot to take the trash out. Verse 7. Husbands, likewise. Now, what we say the word likewise means? Now, when you start talking about submission, my wife always says the S word. <laughs> he used the S word again. In the same way that you submit to your government, in the same way that a slave submits to a master, in the same way that Jesus chose to endure the cross, in the same way that these ladies are supposed to act with their husbands, husbands likewise dwell with understanding giving honor to your wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together with you in the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. 
Hey, in the same way that you understand how your husband is wired, guys, it's imperative that you dwell with your wife with understanding. That means you learn to adopt their mindset. And just because it's not important to you doesn't mean it's not important. And just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it shouldn't be understood. And just because it's not a high priority with you doesn't mean it's not a priority. Husbands dwell with them with understanding. Now that's difficult. We're wired differently than females are. I heard a comedian talk about the male brain versus the female brain. The male brain is a series of boxes, which is like a little chart. And my boxes don't overlap, my boxes don't touch. And if I'm in my TV watching box, I can't be in my talking box. And if I'm in my talking box, I can't be in my TV watching box, by the way. <laughs> if I'm in my texting on my cell phone box, I can't be on my interaction with my wife box. I have a box for everything, and my boxes don't touch. In the middle of all my boxes is my favorite box. It is an empty box. And I can sit in a tree stand waiting for a depressed deer to walk by me and think of nothing. For hours at the time. And when you ask your husband, what are you thinking? He goes, nothing. He's not lying. That's the box we like to be in. We just like to go. And it's a beautiful place to be. You should learn to get there. But a woman's mind doesn't work that way. A woman's mind is like a ball of string. And if you pull a string on this side, it moves on this side. And it's really, really weird. It's like, look at that girl's shoes. That's a pretty color. That's the same color those eggs we colored at Easter, the year we bought Lonnie Beth that little yellow dress, dressing. We need salad dressing. <laughs> That's the way that thing works. You laugh because it's true. And Peter says, hey, guys, you got to dwell with them with understanding because they're not wired like you. And things that are important to them aren't important to you but they need to become important to you and then once you can and, and it's about this attunement thing I can see it from your standpoint I don't really understand it but I this is important to you so it's important to me kind of thing dwelling with them with understanding and giving honor to her as the weaker vessel and as heirs in the kingdom I treat my wife with a certain modicum of respect because of a two-factor thing. She's an heir in the kingdom, and she's the weaker vessel. Now, heir in the kingdom, what does that mean? That means in God's view, we're the same status. We have different functions, but we have the same status. Just because you have a different role doesn't give you a different value. Okay? Men are allowed to preach. Men are allowed to be elders. A man can't be an elder unless his wife's got her act together, by the way. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. After he left the men of the temple and went home with a little Jewish girl who's probably 26 years old. When Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and favor with men, that wasn't at the temple. That was at an obscure Jewish carpenter or a little Jewish girl. God has the same value for men and women. Okay? Your heirs in the kingdom, your, your inheritance is the same as mine my inheritance is so we so I, I dwell with you with understanding and I give honor to you on two prongs honor number one I honor you as a weaker vessel I honor you as an heir in the kingdom we've talked about heir in the kingdom now what does it mean to honor my wife as the weaker vessel this one gets me in trouble it could be physiological it could absolutely mean your body's different than her body I do push-ups for a month, and I, I change shirt sizes. When I exercise my muscles, they get bumpy and lumpy. My wife exercises her muscles, they get long and striated. She leans out and tones up, I bulk up. Physically, I'm stronger than she is. Chromosomally, and I, transgender, what do the chromosomes say? X, 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 Y. Ta-da! <laughs> okay. The fact that his chromosomes are that 
means he's three times stronger than that teenage girl that he goes to church with. Given the fact that he likes to pump that iron, he may be five to seven times stronger than she is. It's unbelievable the physiological difference. When I teach a basic drawing class and you want to draw a stick man, you make a line for the shoulders and a short line for the hips and you've drawn a man. You want to draw a female, you make a line for the shoulders, a line for the hips, you've drawn a female. We're arranged physiologically different. You know why men behave like babies when we get hurt? It takes a lot to hurt us. I mean, I deal with bumps and bruises and dinks and bumps all the time. And I don't notice it. I work out at least two days a week with some guys teaching defensive tactics for the police. We call it blue jitsu. And I, I spend an hour and a half with people twice my size, half my age, trying to put me to sleep and submit me with arm and leg locks. And I go home and my wife says, hey, there's, your, your eye's black. Oh, I didn't know that. You got this mark on your head. I, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't know how that happened. But now when it hurts, feed me ice cream and pet me, I'm a baby. Because <laughs> I don't get hurt that often. It has to be a high number on my scale for me to go, oh, man, that hurts. I'm not going to do that anymore. I think my wife gets hurt every day because she's physiologically different than I am. And so she knows how to deal with pain. So when she's sick or doesn't feel good, she says, you know what, this is no different. I, I have to deal with something every single day. And that's why women deal with pain better men because you deal with it on a daily basis. And in order for it to, to, to hit my radar, it's got to be a pretty serious injury. You know, by the time I tell her, hey, honey, I think I need to go to the emergency room, she says, you must be really hurt. <laughs> I let that little battery-powered chainsaw get away the other day, tore up a good pair of Nike shoes. Walked to the house. Called Jackie. Hey, I know you're in the front yard, but uh, I was cutting those bushes you want me to cut. I need you to come look at something. What do you need me to look at? Well, I'm afraid to take my shoe off. <laughs> that battery-powered chainsaw got a little loose. She goes, how bad is it? I said, I hadn't taken my shoe off yet. She goes, it must be bad or you wouldn't have called me. I said, don't panic like that. <laughs> but I, it has to hurt, and when it hurts, it hurts, and I want to be petted. She deals with that every single day. I grab her hand. She goes, you're squeezing my hand too tight. I was just holding your hand. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. You know, one of the, one of the young cops... He told my captain, he goes, yeah, I wrestled Mr. Lonnie like he's been shoeing horses since he was four. <laughs> I don't realize what my grip is sometimes. So it could be that when he says give honor to your wife as the weaker vessel, it's, she's not a barbarian, guys. She doesn't like to have calluses on her hands. She doesn't want to have short nails. She doesn't like to do some of the things you like to do. Men are on teams in order to compete. You know, I've want to get my grandson a patch for his football jersey that says I'm just here for the violence <laughs> that's what he, he just likes to he's been playing flag football he's five he tackles people and pulls their flag gunner that's not the way this is but he's the football players tackle people so he'll drill you in the ground and pull your flag gunner that's not the way the game is played we just like that kind of stuff women don't women are on teams and women compete in order to be on teams it's a different animal so when Paul says, you, when Peter says, you treat them as the weaker vessel, it, it may be just about phys physiology. Or it, it may be something a little deeper than that. Now this is where the part where I get in trouble. So when Jackie started teaching, she didn't teach out of the home until our daughter started the school. So she raises Lonnie Beth until she's school age. When Lonnie Beth starts going to school, their schedules match, so she starts teaching. With her first check... The first time the city of Huntsville said, here's money, she had worked with one of my SWAT guys and she bought me a rifle. A Ruger M77 Mark II, stainless steel, boat paddle stock, bolt action 30-06. That may not mean anything to you. It's a synthetic stock. It's called a skeletized stock. That means it's not made out of a fancy hardwood. It doesn't matter how wet it gets, how hot it gets, or how cold it gets. I could hold it by the barrel and beat a coyote to death with it, and it wouldn't affect that rifle. It's a glass polymer. 
it's stainless steel. I can hunt in the rain, I can hunt in the wind, I can wade through a river with it, pull it out, wipe it off in my t-shirt, and it'll function. It's bolt action. That means there's not a lot of moving parts. You go, and you can't get a feed jam. It's a 30 out 6 If I put the right bullet in it, it'll kill anything that walks from the Arctic Circle to the tip of South America. I'd have to raise it a little bit to go to Africa, but anything in this hemisphere, it's a beast of a gun. It's not something you put on the wall. It's something you hunt with. And with the exception of two deer, every deer I've ever killed with a firearm, I've killed that rifle. On top of that gun is this little thing called a Monarch Scope. Monarch Scope is a little tube with a piece of glass in it. And you look through that little piece of glass, you see these little lines, got these little marks on it. That's a telescopic sight. And you wiggle these little dials on it, and you aim at stuff with it. Mine is zeroed for 250 yards. So at 100 yards, if I aim here, it hits 1.8 inches high. So that at 250 yards, if I aim here, I hit here. Okay, I killed an antelope at 380 yards with it. That's three football fields and all the way up to the opponent's 20. If I can see you five football fields away, I can hit a 12-inch steel plate with it. Five football fields away because of that scope. Now, what happens if I wade in a river with that scope? It ceases to function. <laughs> what happens if I hit that scope against a tree or I let the lens get scratched or I let it get snowed on or I let... What good is that rifle without that scope? It's worthless. So when I carry that rifle, I transport it not based on the characteristics of the rifle, but the characteristics of the scope. It's in a padded case. And when I climb a tree, I don't wear the rifle. I climb the tree and then bring the rifle up on a cord. And when I leave the tree, I lower the rifle and gently put it down. I don't. I don't ride a four-wheeler in the woods because I don't want my rifle mounted on it bouncing through the woods. I want to walk in with my rifle. And without that scope, that rifle is functionless. In that pair, the rifle and the scope, guess what the weaker vessel is? It means it's complicated and it's intricate and it needs special care. That's what weaker vessel means. You've got a man and he's paired with this complicated instrument and if it's not dialed in right you can't hit your target lest your prayers be hindered Did you pick that up if you don't treat her right something happens to your ability to connect with your target and that's not because she's inferior that's because she's intricate and more valuable Hey, Marine, you ain't got to be scared to get killed. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you right now. That's all, that's all I'm saying. You're about, to get, you're about to get triangulated, and I'm not, and I'm not jumping in there to help you, by the way. All right? You kick the hornet's nest, I'll put some ointment on you, but I ain't getting in the middle of it. I am not going to do it. You know, old Marine's over there about to go Iwo Jima. <laughs> But when you understand that when I approach life as a husband, I don't get to approach it with my cavalier attitude. I get to go, hey, let me consider her. Number one, we're equals in God's eye. And number two, she requires some special knowledge and some special understanding. And if I don't know how to adjust to that, the whole system's off. So when you talk about affair proofing your relationships, it comes with a basic understanding of the other person's needs. Whoever meets your basic needs, you will be intimate with. And if you're not intimate, it's because somebody's needs aren't being met. That's plain and simple. Now, if you read Willard Harley's book, His Needs, Her Needs, it's a survey he did of 5,000 couples, 10,000 people, and said, let me talk about what it takes to make a life work. Let me talk to you about what it takes. And he came up with a pretty interesting, not 100% everybody agreed on it, 
but statistically significant, the vast majority of males and the vast majority of females says, this is how our hierarchy of needs work. And would you be shocked if I told you that the man's list of needs and the woman's list of needs were different? <gasps> what? <laughs> yeah. Men's top five needs. Number one, sexual activity. Men get married with the understanding they're going to have sex. Okay? From the time we hit puberty, we start identifying ourselves with our sexual activity and lying about it in the locker room. And men get married with the understanding that we're going to have sex. The person in the marriage who has sex as the least interest controls it. You think about that as a problem. If you only got to shop as much as I was interested in shopping, how does that make you feel, ladies? Oh, oh, that's a bit. You know, I, I tell elders all the time when I do consulting with elders, the person in your congregation who is most conservative has the veto button. The person in your congregation who is most reactive to change controls your congregation. Why? They're not. They, are you uncomfortable or is it unscriptural? We've capitulated to people feeling uncomfortable when it wasn't unscriptural. Well, in the same way, the person who's least interested in sex controls the marriage. And men get married with the assumption we're, we're, gonna, we're going to have sex. Number two for a man is recreational companionship. Men build intimacy by doing. So when you're dating us, you go places with us. You're riding our golf courts, you're riding our bass boats, you bring sandwiches over and watch us repair the transmissions. We're just like boys. We want you to watch us do stuff. I got stuck in a tree in the backyard. Thought I had invented a safety. It is actually called an auto block system. There's a knot called a Prusik knot. It's a wrapped knot, and it will slide up a rope, but won't slide down a rope. We use it to do vertical access. Well, I was out goofing around in an oak tree in the backyard one afternoon and thought, hmm, if that Prusik knot will slide up and not slide down, if I could keep the Prusik knot open, it was attached to my rappel harness. If I suddenly let go of it, would it arrest a fall and catch me in the air? Well, yeah. There's only one way to test that. You earn your Wiley Coyote patch, by the way. So I'm up in this tree. I rig up, put a Prusik knot in, kick out of this tree, and just let go. Whoop! A triple wrap Prusik knot will not slide under less than 1,500 pounds of pressure. And this thing caught me like a champ. Now, the problem is you should extend your rappel device and put the Prusik knot below it so that once it catches you, you can hold above it and free the knot and continue to rappel. If it's above you, God himself cannot extract you from this rope. So I'm hanging in the backyard, 30 feet in, a, in an oak tree, swinging in the breeze, yelling for my wife, Jackie! Jackie! I see the curtain open. Whoop, whoop. Jackie! I hang upside down. Jackie! She opens the door, steps out on the deck and says, I see you. The whole neighborhood heard you. You're as bad as a little boy and walks back in. And I'm still hanging in the tree. I had to cut myself out of my own harness and fall to the ground. But anyway, men want you to do stuff with them. We want you to watch us swing on our ropes and drive our golf carts and hit little golf balls. Because when we're dating, you do stuff with us. And we go home and tell our buddies, man, I met this girl. She goes anywhere with me. She went rock climbing. She went fishing. She watched the UFC fight. And you do stuff with us. Now, once we get married, you start raising kids and nesting, and then you quit being our playmate. And, but we still want you to be with us and do stuff. Probably not all the time, but m most of the time. Okay? Number three, men value an attractive spouse. Now, this is not my survey, so don't throw stuff at me. Okay? But it's, and it's not about being a certain dress size or about being a certain weight. It's presentation. What do you do with what you got? When we're dating you, we can't come in the house until you've had your hair done. We can't see you till you come down the stairs and you're ready. And you take nine years figuring out that you don't have anything to wear. We get married, and then all of a sudden the terry cloth robe and the fuzzy bunny slippers show up. 
I remember seeing her in that robe that her mother bought. I said, baby, don't move. I can get it off your back right now. <laughs> My mother bought this for me, you know. <laughs> but you have this rule that says we can't see you until you're beautiful. And then we get married and some of that goes out the window. Men are visually stimulated. If we're not looking at you, we're looking at somebody. And that has nothing to do with your dress size or your weight or your shape. It's what do you do with what you got? Number four on a man's list is domestic support. Now, we give verbal agreement to the fact that, hey, I've got a job, you've got a job, and, and uh, I, I've got some responsibilities in the house as well. But in our lizard brain, we have the expectation that you'll do stuff at our house like our mom did. It's Neanderthal, a knuckle-dragger, mouth-breather, but we expect you to be the domestic engineer. John Gottman says traditional roles actually make marriages healthier. Now, to be fair, if we're in bed and there's a bump in the night, who has to check it? Why? Because I'm the man. She pats me on my stomach. Jonesy, 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 I heard something. There's a Benelli shotgun in the corner. Go clear the house. You know how. But no, no, no. Something woke me up. Want me to find what woke me up? Yes. <laughs> Done. Good night. <laughs> you woke me up. I didn't hear it. But I have to get out of bed and go check it. Why? I'm the man. I'm in charge of all vermin and all bumps in the nights. And by the way, gentlemen, if you go check a bump in the night, don't take sports equipment. Walk through your house with a baseball bat. What do you expect to find? Some dude in the living room in his underwear? Hey, <laughs> thought I'd come throw a few innings. <laughs> no. <laughs> take something that'll take care of business if there's a heffalump or a woozle in your house. Don't take sports equipment. Anyway. I expect her to do some things at the house that my mom did, and she expects me to take care of vermin and bumps in the night because I'm the man, she's the woman. And then number five on that list is, is admiration. I don't want to be demeaned. I don't want to be mocked. I can be teased, good-natured stuff. We all do that. But I want to be treated with respect like Peter talked about. Sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, an attractive spouse, domestic support and admiration. Now, ladies, let's be honest. Play with me, play with me, look good for me, clean up after me, and tell me I'm great. <laughs> if you can't do that, don't have pets, okay? A goldfish is harder to maintain than that if you'll just do it. The reason this doesn't happen is because of this little list over here. Her number one need is affection. And affection is so different than physical interaction. They're not friends on Facebook. The way a woman sees affection is, do you understand my world? Do you get to me and do you respond to it? Uh, I know where I'm speaking in 2023, assuming I live that long. I know when I'm hunting in Missouri. I know when I'm hunting in Georgia. I know when the next UFC fight is on. I know what my schedule is with the police for the next four months. I'm a master of controlling the events in my life. But I can't seem to remember the trash truck comes every Monday at 7. <laughs> Did you roll the truck? I forgot. What have I just told her about her world and her needs? Found out Lonnie Beth was pregnant. I built a three-story treehouse in my backyard. Call it Fort Gunner. It's got one of those giant tubes suspended by a cable, a 20-foot tube slide, 160-foot zip line, has three stories. Built it myself using ropes and pulleys to get everything in the air. And the kitchen sink's been leaking three months. <laughs> That's not true. My kitchen sink does not leak. But if it does, and I've got this monstrosity out in the yard, and her faucet leaks, what have I told her about her? Okay. So she wants affection, and affection is not physical affection. Now, if you give that kind of affection, it leads to that kind of affection, okay? But her number one need is affection. Number two for her is communication, conversation. Women build intimacy by talking. Men build intimacy by doing. Hey, Lonnie, who's your best friend? Bob, what do you do? We hunt and we fish together. You know how men hunt together? We drive to the woods. You go a mile that way. I go a mile that way. 
and we spend all day by ourselves and we hunted together. If I'm sitting in a boat with a dude and we hadn't said a word in two hours, it's cool. And if a dude looks at me and goes, are we okay? One of us is getting in the water. I'm just telling you that right now. But if we drive from our house to Piggly Wiggly and it's too quiet, my, is, are we okay? Because when you're dating and she's in your bass boat and in your golf cart and watching you repair your transmission, you're comfortable, so what are you doing? And then she goes home and tells her friends, I met the most wonderful guy. We talk about anything. I know his hopes and his dreams and his aspirations. And then you get married and your communication degrades. So, hmm, uh, what, what? She calls me at work. Hey, hey, what you doing? I'm working. And that's what I do. I do things. People give me money. That describes my life. And then the phone gets quiet. What are you doing? Well, I slept till about 8 o'clock. Then I got up and took Oreo for a walk. We got to the top of the hill, and I did some leash training. Then I did some off-leash training. And then I came home, and I made some waffles, those waffles like your mom made the year we went to the Smokies. She talks 15 minutes, hadn't covered five minutes of her day. I would not live long enough to finish this conversation. But if I cut her off, what does it tell her? I don't care about you. You're not important. She wants to know the details of my life. And she wants me to hear the details of her life. Affection, communication, openness, and honesty. You must be transparent with your wife. Where you're going, who you're with, what you spent, what you looked at, who you're texting. If I see a hundred couples this year and they've all had an affair, one of those women will say, I can't believe he had sex with her. 99 of those women will say, I can't believe he lied to me. Because the deal breaker of an affair is not the sex, it's the dishonesty. And women can forgive the fact you had sex with somebody else. They can't forgive the fact that you were dishonest. They can't live with a man they can't trust. Her number four need is financial security. Now she may have a job, she may have a career, her career may be better than yours. But in her heart of hearts, in the lizard part of her brain, she believes you'll take care of her like her dad did. And that you're the provider. And you don't have to wait on your perfect job. You've got to do the job that feeds your family. And no matter what it takes you to do it, she has that expect. She left her childhood home. She left her childhood friends. And she left her last name to follow you on your adventure. You better provide for her. And then, and then the last thing that she needs from you is family commitment. Then when push comes to shove and you draw a circle around the only people that matter, it's her and the kids. God first. My number one responsibility to God is my wife. My number one responsibility to my wife is my children. Spouse before kids, family before friends, family before career. That's her needs. Now it's interesting, you could pick left or right, one through five, and take any one of those things away, and they, had a, they have a cascading effect. And what I run into with most couples is she's a maid and he's bringing home a check. And everything else is missing in the relationship. Whoever provides these things for you, you'll be intimate with. And that's how to affair-proof your marriage. Is this is not read his needs, her needs, and say, this is what you have to do for me. I read his needs, her needs, and go, this is what I have to do for you. Based on the fact from what Peter says, hey, this is how, this is how men work. And guys, you've got to dwell with your wife with understanding, providing for her those needs. And if you meet each other's needs, you're less likely to be involved in an affair. Correlation, not causation. But when I sit down and talk to a couple who's had an affair, I ask about those five things with him. I ask about those five things with her. And with the exception, well, I, there's not even an exception. Even if it's not true that she's not meeting the needs, there's a perception on his part that she's not meeting the needs. It may be an interpretation error, but affairs lock in to those different needs. And sometimes those needs can be channeled into what we call love languages. The way I say I love you, 
is the way I hear I love you and the way I hear I love you is the way I say I love you. Everybody doesn't have the same language. You've got to understand that, that some people, quality time is more important to them than physical touch. Some people, physical touch is more important than gifts. Some people, gifts is more important than, than words of affirmation. And understanding that about your spouse, and if you haven't taken the love languages survey, I, I, I challenge you to do that. It's public domain on the internet. You might be surprised that, you know, I think I'm telling you I love you, and you're not hearing it because I'm not speaking your language. Absolutely had this happen. Send the guy out, girl sitting there. So I've been talking to you guys for a little bit. Do you believe your husband loves you? I don't think he loves me at all. Why don't you think he loves me? He works 90 hours a week. We haven't been on vacation in two years. He's never been to a soccer game or a dance recital with the kids. Oh, okay. She sits in the lobby. He comes in. Do you love your wife? Absolutely. How would you prove it? Man, I work 90 hours a week. I haven't been on vacation in three years. I don't have time to go to a basketball game, a soccer game, or a dance recital. He's killing himself trying to say, I'm providing for you. I love you. And she says, I'd like to have less money and more time. And sometimes we just don't understand that. And, and it, it, it takes asking, hey, the way I'm doing business, does it work for you? And it's okay if a wife says, no, this, if, if, if this could be different, it would be better. Or the husband say, if this could be different, it would be better. And you have to take, this is ideal, and this is unacceptable, and there's stuff in the middle that works. When we get into to alternate universes and we start comparing fantasies, Ideal and unacceptable is separated about like that. Well, if he didn't do it all, he didn't do it any. If it's not everything I like, it's not anything I like. And, and we take the idea of that we're imperfect people and there's ideal and there's unacceptable. And that exists on a continuum, not an either or. But there's, there's kind of a room to work. You know, what, what, it's not ideal, but we're way away from unacceptable. So this is where we're going to build our house. This is what we're going to do because there's no perfect people and we need to adjust to those imperfections but when we decide that oh this person doesn't fulfill X Y or Z and I'm gonna camp out on that and I've got negative sentiment override they never they always it's always been bad then it goes away and I'm not meeting your needs and you're not meeting my needs and somebody will come along who will meet those needs because it's not good that man be alone. Man's going to find a place for companionship. Not good that woman be alone. She's going to find a place for companionship. You know how to build a good relationship. You got married. Sometimes it's just about continuing to date rather than dating and being married. It's We're married, but I'm, I'm on a lifelong date. And I should be on my best behavior. All right. I, I, we're close enough to noon that I need to wrap up. When we start back, we'll entertain questions. And then we'll wrap up. What's the schedule? All right. So we've got uh, time to go eat. And then when we start back, I'll bring your questions and then we'll wrap up.